they didn't want it to have nothing to do with it. Okay. My father was like, you're crazy. You know, you should be paying for, to, to, to record your music. And I went for it. Okay. And I went and sell, it sold the idea. And I didn't have the show. I sold the freaking show, a show that I didn't have. You have to know about business if you want to make it in show business. That's it. That's why it's called show business. Everybody was like, what did you drink? I want to have something <laughs> like that. What you're drinking? Everybody was afraid. Okay. Everybody was like threatened and, and they thought that I was crazy. Mm. He has 33 albums, eight Grammy and Latin Grammy awards, and has sold millions of records around the world. But what many may not know about regional Mexican music icon Pepe Aguilar is that more than 20 years ago, he launched his own record label, Machine Records, a 360 media company that has shaped the careers of his children, Angel Aguilar and Leonardo Aguilar, and is developing new talent like Irani. The music executive and artist joins Business School today to tell us what business lessons he learned from his parents, Antonio Aguilar and Flor Silvestre, how launching a website when no one else was changed his business, and why he decided to break away from the big labels and go independent at a pinnacle in his career. Plus, he tells us what it takes to put a national live tour together. I'm journalist Fernando Hurtado, and on Business School, I'm on a mission to map one of the fastest growing groups of entrepreneurs in the United States, Latinos. We're tracking how they got started, found success, and the most important lessons they've learned along the way. And remember, Business School is expensive. Business School is free. All right, Pepe Aguilar, welcome to Business School. How are you? Thank you. I'm great. Thank you for having me. Thanks for stopping by. So I feel like one of the easiest ways to get to know someone is by looking at their credit card statement. We're mm -hmm. not going to do that with you. <laughs> but I am curious, what's the last thing you spent money on, big or small? Uh, in the last few days, probably uh, somebody bought a hamburger for me. Okay. I, 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 don't, I don't carry a wallet anymore. A what? Yeah. Is it you're an Apple Pay guy? Uh, I'm an Apple Pay guy, but also I, there's always someone around me okay. that takes care of that. And how often are you e eating burgers? Is that a common expense for you? For sure. I love burgers. Are you kidding? Yeah. I mean, I also love a, 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 a three Michelin star restaurant, but I mean, I eat everything. Burgers are a good safe bet. Yes. Usually. Um, Depends on the place you go, I eat it out. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. All burgers are good. <laughs> All burgers are created equal. So, um, <laughs> Bibi, you music is in your veins, and yes. it may be literally in your veins because you were born during a tour stop of your parents. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you don't remember anything of that day. No. If you do speak now. But assuming you don't, what, what, have, what did your parents tell you about that day, or what do you know about <laughs> how, how that happened? Well, they were touring. Mm -hmm. uh, it was back in 1968. And my mother toured and, and sang and performed uh, until like two weeks before I was born. So she was like this, not on a horseback, not on horseback, uh, but, but she did perform on stage, which is kind of uh, um, not a very good decision, but it was 1968, okay? So uh, people weren't as aware as we are right now um so yeah i was i was born on a tour and um my parents uh didn't plan it that mm -hmm. way you know they wanted me to born in mexico but uh then they were always working and that's what happened never lived in san antonio i, I was born in san antonio mm -hmm. texas never lived there it was just part of the tour and uh but I, but I toured with my parents for 20-some years, so coming to America, coming to the U.S. was a regular thing for me. And you're immediately surrounded by music, and what I think is interesting is that as much as you and you have built a career off of regional Mexican music, one of your first music loves was rock music. Mm -hmm. And as someone who's perfectly bilingual in English and Spanish, did you ever consider maybe going the more rock English music route? I did some rock in the beginning of my career, but it was in Spanish, okay. not in English. I, I, I have never considered singing uh, rock in English, but, but I did sang some rock in Spanish, and I was very good at it, so 
<laughs> Thank God. <laughs> because I like mariachi and I like rancheras mm -hmm. more than rock to sing. To sing, to perform yeah. it. And you, um, you, you mentioned that later on you, you start your own label. Before even that, like I'm guessing when you were a teenager or a kid, do you remember when you started seeing music more so than a career, but also the, the business side of things and music as a business? When did that kind of light bulb turn on for you? You know, I, I've always been... I've always been questioning everything, mm -hmm. like religion and, and, and why is everything this way? Why things are run the way they are run? Mm -hmm. Every, 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 uh, uh, since I was a, a very young child, uh, I've been questioning myself those things. So I saw my dad working all the time mm -hmm. on, on a movie set or in a recording studio or on, uh, at a stage. And there was something that I was very curious about, what, what drives him mm -hmm. to do that? Because I was a very lazy young child, I, young boy. I, I mean, the, I couldn't see myself doing that. It was puzzling for me. Later on in life, I found out what drive and passion means, you know, and having a dream. And that what he had, that's what he had. And... I saw that as an example mm -hmm. from a very early age. If you want to do something, you got to do it with passion and you got to do it all in. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to be the result you expect. And that, that was his example. Okay. So when I started doing my thing, mm -hmm. that was the operating system. You know, I was very passionate, all in, yeah. and I didn't care what happened. My dreams were more important than anything else. Yeah, and can you fill us in a little bit on the context at the time? Because I think a lot of people hear an artist and they're like, oh, an artist is with a label. A label's kind of, mm -hmm. for those who even maybe know how it works, a label's the one kind of, you know, helping the artist produce the music, but okay. they're with the label. Back in the day uh, when you were starting off, um, what was like? What was the common mainstream way to, to produce music? Was it that same model? Okay, so if, if, if our audience... And the audience of the uh, uh, of, of the podcast were Martians. Okay. Okay. And they didn't know anything about mm -hmm. anything here in in in, mm -hmm. in, in 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 this planet. Okay. For to do music the way that it's established and the way it was established back then in the nineties, eighties when I when when I started. Mm -hmm. You needed to have a third party, which in this case was a record company. Okay. Or 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 somebody that could. Um, deliver your music to the masses. Mm -hmm. You could only, uh, as an artist, um, create the music mm -hmm. if you had the um, means to create it. Mm -hmm. If you were a, a composer, an arranger, a musician, not just a singer, uh -huh. if you created everything, you will also need someone to put that music out. You couldn't put it outside yourself. Yeah. Now it's a different story. Now you can do it all mm -hmm. from your phone, mm -hmm. right? You can, you can create everything from your phone and especially nowadays with AI and, and the internet of things which is around the corner and everything connected uh, it, it's a whole different story than when I first started in this business when I first started in this business it was it's more about dreaming than planning explain that <laughs> yeah you you had more the uh, dream of being an artist to uh -huh. to to put your music out there the, the 99% of artists didn't think about the business I see. it was more about your dreams it was more about putting your music out there and and, and being seen mm -hmm. and that was a mistake oh. <laughs> well so you start off with that traditional model yeah. as as would anyone else i imagine yeah. but then you do a shift what what caused that shift for you to say you know what i'm gonna go and start my own label yeah. well i saw that things weren't balanced and and artists were being abused and mm. the business were not was not doing what was not doing uh, people weren't doing the business correctly okay you know it, it wasn't fair okay to the artist the complete artist the end. okay yeah to, to the to the main you know uh, um asset of the business <laughs> so, so then you start equinoxian and machine yeah, records so then i start 
fighting my way. First, I signed with a company. Okay. And then when I found out these things that I just told you, or or at least felt that it wasn't fair, I started asking the record company for a better deal. Uh -huh. I said, hey, I'm selling this, this amount of money, so why are you giving me 5% of uh -huh. this? This is, this is stupid. This is absurd. And their, their answer was, well, that's the way uh, the business is run, mm. and we're not the only ones doing that. Everybody does it. That was their answer. Deal with it. Yeah. Mm. And I was like 18 years old. Okay. And, and it was like, heck with this. I mean, mm. the, the heck with this, pardon my French, but mm. this ain't right. Mm -hmm. So at 19, I hired a lawyer and sued the company. Wow. Okay, and what are your parents saying around all they this? Didn't want, they didn't want it to do, they didn't want it to have nothing to do with it. Okay. My father was like, you're crazy, you know, you should be paying for, to, to, to record your music. Yeah, that, that was their wow. okay. paradigm. They were there, you know, they, they didn't make music out of selling music, so mm -hmm. they didn't care. Those artists, they just wanted to make shows. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's absurd. Mm. That's stupid. That's crazy. I mean, we're creating everything. How can you not care for that? You know, so I, I went on and did it myself and, and started one of my first legal battles against the company. Uh, uh, that was my first one. Uh, I, I, had, I have had three. Okay. Um, but that was very significant because that was the first one in the history of music in Mexico wow. that did something like that. And what were industry people telling you? Like you're They hated me. Uh. Yeah, like people in the industry hated me. I was the black sheep. And were you concerned at all? Like, oh man. Like oh, heck no. Huh. That, that was my gasoline. That mm -hmm. was my drive. Even though I was very young, mm -hmm. it was like, hmm, am I piss I'm pissing everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody's mad. I must be doing something right. Mm. So I kept on going. He stayed on that path. And what I think is interesting, if GoDaddy.com is correct, on March 3rd, 1998, you registered pepeaguilar.com. <laughs> Tell me about the decision to, to create a website and to create a website back then. <laughs> I, I saw in technology an, an emancipation route. Okay. I saw it from the beginning. I, I am a gamer. Uh, I started playing games on the internet since it was possible. And that kind of shifted my mind in the way of seeing things and seeing technology and, and seeing ways to use that technology uh, towards my, my goals and careers and passions. So when the digital world started in music, mm -hmm. when, you, when you were able to, uh, to, to use that technology, everything changed for me. That was back in... In the nineties, I don't, I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> but, but I, I, I've been, I've been pretty much into technology since I started my career. So, every technology that was available, I was adopting it. And, and as you, as it as, came out, as it came out. Now it's crazy. Now technology grows exponentially, and it's impossible to catch up. Mm -hmm. So you have to focus on, on, on just one side of it, and that's what I do now. Pick and choose, kind of mm. pick and choose your, your battles. Yes. Um, what I, I thought was really interesting is that there was a telenovela in Mexico that later aired in the United States that I think a lot of people will recognize your voice from, mm. and that was Destilando Amor yeah. around 2006, 2007. I've always been curious about the business implications or ramifications of having your song play Monday through Friday for six to seven months as the telenovela airs on you know broadcast television, not only in, in Mexico, but Latin America in the United States. What was the aftermath of a moment like that where, where your song is played every single day? Well, how deep do you want to get to that rabbit hole? Because... Let's go deep. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the things that are not very well established yet in okay. order to be fair. Okay. Up until now. So, a telenovela or, or, or a program that is going to be playing your song every day uh -huh. for months, it depends on the country, but it should give you a lot of money. Mm -hmm. 
and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. What they do is that they fix a, 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 a um, rate okay. from the beginning, and you do it more for promotion than for money. So that's why you don't see me doing that a lot anymore. Every season. Well, I, I, I compare it kind of to the Super Bowl, where, mm -hmm. you know, Usher just did his Super Bowl performance. Mm -hmm. You don't get paid, like, the people think you get paid, like, millions of dollars. You don't. Well, no. And, but what you do see is a spike in sales and, and streams. Is that similar to kind of what for you sure, see? For sure. For sure. I mean, that was a great example, the, the Usher example. It wouldn't surprise me if Usher paid... Uh -huh. A few million dollars to do that. To put I mean, on the show. Right. Yeah. I mean, he didn't pay the NFL. Uh -huh. He didn't bribe the NFL. But if he got that chance mm -hmm. to, see, to be seen by hundreds of millions of people, who do you have to kill? <laughs> you know, because yeah. the, 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 the um, consequences of that mm -hmm. are going to represent, for him, mm -hmm. $300 million dollars. More than that, mm -hmm. and he just spent two. Right, the return on investment is there. Although, although you have to give a good performance, uh -huh. so that's when the gamble starts. Yeah, you have to gamble on yourself. You have to be sure about yourself. You are the product. Yeah, you are the product. You're selling yourself, and you know how much you're worth. Because I can assure you that Usher is a businessman, mm -hmm. a very savvy one. Mm -hmm. Because that's the way artists are now. You know, I started being one of the first, mm -hmm. but if you're not business savvy right now, you should be dedicating yourself to another trade, something else. You have to know about business if you want to make it in show business. That's it. That's why it's called show business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it'd just be called a show. Um, exactly. So... Uh, I want to go back to the start of Equinoxio and Machine. You're this young guy who is having this legal battle. You decide to start your own label. Like, what is the first step to to starting a company and, and registering? Did you know how to do that? Ignorance. That's the first step. You you, you, okay. you need to be very innocent and need to be wishfully thinking because it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. If 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 I would have known 24 years ago what I know right now uh -huh. I, I, that that is what was it going to cost me to get to where I am in work that is not artistic related uh -huh. I don't know man I I, I, I probably would have think about things a little bit more uh -huh. um, but it's it's been it, it's it's worth it mm -hmm. you know it's it, it's been a lot of work it's been dog years mm -hmm. for me of work I have to work with many different hats uh -huh. all the time and like wearing them really good not not just put in there mm -hmm. you have to wear them completely and that it's, it's been hard but uh, I'm not a victim at all, mm -hmm. at all I don't feel myself as a victim I think that um, I would have made some changes in what I've done in order to not work as I have worked because mm -hmm. I worked a lot mm -hmm. to work to get to where I am, but there was no path. There, there were no roads. There was no history to follow. So I was just going, you know, flying by wire. Yeah. You know, by instruments. Yeah. Yeah. Building the airplane as you yeah, fly. Yeah. You 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 were making the path. Yeah. Um. So in two thousand nine you decide to launch your own footwear line mm. around that time. Oh, don't remind me of that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It was just something that was not successful. We can, okay. we can talk about it, no problem. Well, but go how ahead, do you choose, like, you know, like that that opportunity presents itself. How do you choose, yeah, let's go for it, or you know what, maybe not worth it. What did you learn from that experience? I mean, I, I've always been curious about other businesses, not only the, the thing that okay. I do. So I, I, I'm a... Um, born entrepreneur, um, so I, I, I've, I've been in many other businesses. I, I have had uh, greenhouses and, mm -hmm. and created, uh, planted tomatoes, mm -hmm. and I, I, I have sports teams and, and, and different things. And, and this shoe making episode was a very ambitious one. But I was very naive and, and didn't know anything about the business. Mm -hmm. So, uh, boys and girls, 
that's that's a no no. <laughs> if you're gonna go into something, you need to know a little bit about it, you know, in order not to go 25 years to know what I know right now. Mm. Like I said, it probably I would have taken a different path, maybe a little more education, maybe okay. some, you know, maybe something that could help me with my everything. So this this case is the same, but. I forgot forgot what you asked me, but anyway. Yeah, what'd you learn from it? And it sounds it was, you know, know the industry you're going into yeah. or know the business? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. a good lesson. Uh, something I'm really excited to ask you about. In 2012, you get your star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, which is a massive deal because immediately I picture... I mean, I saw the video, the video of you with the star, and that's a visual that a lot of people see. Uh, for a lot of people, it's a long time coming, finally has one for a lot of people. Maybe it's their introduction to who Pepe Aguilar is. Mm. How does something like that impact your career? Of, of, everything that is um, relevant uh -huh. and accepted by society as a good thing mm -hmm. helps your career. Okay. Uh, Playing in the Super Bowl is, is like one of the highest things that can help your career. Mm -hmm. Having a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame, it's an important thing mm -hmm. in your career. I don't know how many tickets you're going to sell with that mm -hmm. or how many songs people are going to listen more because you have a Hollywood, uh, star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. But it's, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a very good... Like, um, como se dice, um, reminder mm -hmm. of who you are, uh, validation in your trade. So, of course, it helps. But everything is different. Like, a number one in Billboard helps you in a, in a, in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Like, a sold-out tour helps you in a different way. Mm -hmm. Playing in the Super Bowl helps you in a different way. Having a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame helps you in a different way. Not only one thing is going to give you everything you need. You need to have hundreds of mm -hmm. those things, and you need to not not stop. Mm -hmm. So now, okay, so is the Hollywood Walk of Fame, what's next? Uh -huh. So is the Super Bowl, what's next? Mm -hmm. So it's a never-ending, never-ending story. About doing yourself, about doing yourself. Yes. So I, next I want to ask you about how having kids changes you as a person, how it affects your career. But first, I want to make time for someone else to ask you a question. And this question comes from a Comcast Rise Award recipient. So okay. Comcast Rise supports the growth of all small businesses and individuals committed to uplifting their communities. Rise has awarded more than $125 million in monetary, marketing, and technology grants nice. to businesses all over the United States. So let's hear the question. Hi, my name is Sheila Lopez, and I am the proud owner of Indiglo Holistics, located here in Baltimore, Maryland. Can you provide an example of a tough decision you had to make and how it turned out for your business, whether it was good or bad, and the lesson that you learned? Thank you for asking. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I think that at a certain level, in uh, being an entrepreneur, all your decisions are important and difficult um, because everything is on the line. It's your business. Mm -hmm. So you, you're not being employed and it's not like, oh, you didn't get a certain performance and probably that's going to affect your bonus or, mm -hmm. but your life is not going to change a lot mm -hmm. if, you, if you screw up or if you make it very big on whatever project it is that you're doing. Right here, uh -huh. if you own your company, if you are your own product, every decision is important. And some of them is like life and death decisions. And you got to take those every year. Mm -hmm. Like one example, Jaripeo Sin Fronteras, mm -hmm. this show that I made and created with horses and everything. That was crazy. I mean, we're not curing cancer. We're not going, we're not flying anyone to outside the solar system. It's just show business. Uh -huh. It's just a show, okay? But for me and my world, it was huge because it, it, it was a huge uh, uh, undertaking and I was alone. Mm. Like I had a managing team and I had partners and everything, but when I, I was doing very well by myself mm -hmm. and then I, in one of the meetings, 
some people were on Zoom, some people were in present, and they said, you know what, guys, I, 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 I have an idea. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to like it, but it involves horses, <laughs> and it involves doing a new show, and it involves investing a couple of million dollars okay. and, and, and bringing some people to tell you what to do. And, and uh -huh. everybody was like, what did you drink? I want to have something <laughs> like that that you're drinking. Everybody was afraid. Okay. Everybody was like threatened and and they thought that I was crazy mm. because you never change horses in the middle of a race if you're doing good, if you're, mm -hmm. going, up, if you're going in front. Mm -hmm. But that's been me. So I felt it. I felt that it was a good thing. I felt that it was needed uh -huh. and I went for it. Okay. And I went and sell, it sold the idea to live, to CMN, okay. which is a company that makes shows live. And I didn't have the show. Uh, I sold the freaking show, a show that I didn't have. Okay. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> okay. So she's asking, you know, gutsy decisions or, 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 or things that have changed me for the better. Uh -huh. Will this change me for the better? Okay. This decision was life or death. Uh, it, if it would have been would have been bad, it would have cost me millions of dollars uh -huh. and a couple of years of my career. So there there was a lot of things on the line. Reputation, reputation, mm -hmm. credibility, mm -hmm. you know, leverage with my associates. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot, <laughs> everything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but I, I went ahead and did it, okay. and and it was it was a success, a, success, a huge okay. success. Bigger than I was expecting, and and that's a story. So you bet on yourself, and you believed in, in yourself, and and, and, and I have some some horror stories too. Uh -huh. This is this is one that is successful one. Okay, but I of course I have horror stories that I've cried a lot, man. Mm. I've cried so many times in my career, like with such a passion, and it's okay, you know, it's part of it. So I want to hear about how you turn Jaripeo Sin Fronteras into Jaripeo, or how it changes and what we can expect from uh, Jaripeo Hasta Los Huesos. But before that, I want to talk about the year 2006, okay. when a company with a green logo pops up in Sweden. I don't know if you can guess what I'm going to ask. What are you uh, going to ask me about Spotify? Yes. So <laughs> Spotify and the shift from physical CDs and radio even to streaming. How did that change your business model and kind of how you approached uh, music. Remember that I am from a generation that live shows are their main uh -huh. source of income. And that hasn't changed for me. It only grew because now I have another source of revenue, which is live, the streamings and mm -hmm. the new technologies. Mm -hmm. So I just adapted. It's all about evolution and adapting, if you want, mm -hmm. if you can. Was the kind of the decline of physical CDs, was that ever, did that make you kind of stop a little? No. 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 I, like I said at the beginning of, of our conversation, I've always embraced technology with very optimistic and positive uh, uh, view. Mm -hmm. Always, always, always. So when I was doing... LPs and, 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 and 45 singles, which a lot of you guys don't know what I'm talking about. You can Google it. Uh, I was happy. And then it changed from cassettes and that to CDs. Uh -huh. I was so happy, uh -huh. like when it changed to CDs. And then when CDs, CDs were all over and, and, and we put everything on the cloud, uh -huh. um, I was very happy. I'm a little scared to have everything in the hands of third parties. Everything, everything that I own, technology, technologically wise and musically wise. I mean, uh, but that's probably because I was born in the last century, and and I like physical things mm -hmm. more than just intangible ones. Yeah. But uh, that's another story. Anyway, it didn't affect me at all. Uh, to the contrary, it has made my business grow a lot more. Nice. Um, so in the late 90s, early 2000s, you have your kids. And then, you know, after the, the Spotify, advent of Spotify and streaming, your kids are much older at this point. 
tell me about the decision. Like, was there ever any hesitation to let your kids start with a music career as well? No, and I didn't push them either. Okay. So it was their decision. They they did travel with us, so mm -hmm. I think that had something to do mm -hmm. with their decision and becoming artists because they were going with an artist, touring and just having fun. And that life, from that perspective, mm -hmm. all comfortable and, and everything fine, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. If you're a kid, you're traveling, I mean, you're, you're meeting people, you're eating different food, you're being praised and love and they, you go to places that are full that they love their your dad so of course they wanted to do that mm -hmm. and uh two of them did mm -hmm. um two of them didn't they they didn't like it but when they said hey i wanna i wanna i want to i want to do this I, it was natural for me i i didn't think twice about it i say well whatever you want to do and also if they have said i want to be a race car driver uh-huh Go for it. Go for it. I mean, it's your life. It's not mine. I'm not just your dad, not your owner. Yeah. But what I think is interesting is that, you know, having Angela and Leonardo in the music space, this also now gives you a chance to, like, see what it's like now to start off in this new age. What are some of the biggest differences you've seen in, in how an uh, artist starts a music career now versus when you oh, were starting? It's totally different, everything. I mean, we, 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 would, we would have to make another podcast <laughs> because it, everything has changed. Everything has changed. They, they have more control over their music. Mm -hmm. They have more control over their careers. Um, and they have more ways to connect. They can connect immediately. Uh, if you're good, there's just no way mm -hmm. that people won't see you. So that didn't exist back in the day. Mm -hmm. that, the planets needed to be aligned mm -hmm. in order for you to be seen. Uh -huh. Now it's up to you and your, if you're good or not. Yeah. It, it really is. That's crazy, because you you don't have an excuse. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the record company did this. Nope, you <laughs> did it wrong. That's why you're not doing what you needed to do or what you want to do money-wise and artistically-wise. Yeah. And with Machine, you have a 360, Machine and Equinox, you have a 360 management company label. Yeah. Um, how has it been to work with them through that? I mean, you're, you're not just their dad, but you're also their business partner, manager, et cetera. How does that work? It's, it, it's been good. Sometimes it's challenging. Yeah. Of course. You know, and especially now that they are grownups mm -hmm. and, and they're, they're savvy and they're business savvy. They were educated by me mm -hmm. and, and my wife, which is my partner in, 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 in business. So everything that they have seen me fought for now they're fighting for, mm -hmm. but they're fighting me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not being the record company that was fighting me. Mm -hmm. So the contracts that I give my artists are unique mm -hmm. in the industry because I went through so many things and, and I suffered so much. Uh, I wouldn't like them to suffer the same, whether they're my kids or not. So Machine and Equinoxios contracts just so you know, are the best in the industry, mm. the best in the industry, because they're made for artists. Mm. So my kids own their stuff. We are able to exploit it for a little while, but then they, they come retain. back to them. They retain that. And that, Luis Miguel can say that. Mm. Is that similar to the Taylor Swift debacle where she didn't own it, now she does own her, is that similar? Yeah, she signed. I'm not an expert on Taylor Swift. There's a lot of people that are going to correct me here. But what I understand is that her first contract, it was signed the old way, okay. where, where companies keep your rights. Can you imagine? Yeah. Forever. Like, if you signed a contract with a record company as a songwriter, singer-songwriter, uh -huh. back in 1985, uh -huh. they will be the owners of that in music. Perpetuity. In perpetuity. Not, now they change those laws uh -huh. for 30 years, but when you signed it, it was in perpetuity. Wow. And, and that was crazy. That's why I started a legal battle against, against the character company. Anyway, I, I went somewhere else. So you were telling me about my kids. Um, so they have a very, a, a very, very good contract. Mm -hmm. and they don't fight me because of that. They fight because they want more promotion, but then again, all artists do. 
including me. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that I think also sets you apart in the industry is that I went on your YouTube and I found 400 plus episodes of a vlog. Tell me about the decision to start this series that opens you up to your fans in really, really de like detailed ways. You know, you're you're either touring with you, you're talking about meetings with them. But not only to start that idea, tell me also about the what goes into sustaining that and something that is also very, very well produced. It's not just like, oh, you pull up a camera and you upload the video. So tell me a little bit about um, El Blog. El Blog was something that came up out of that possibility of being connected and and uh, being connected that way mm. for the first time in my career I, I, I went crazy I went crazy I it was like oh my god this is perfect I can I'm not gonna need a middleman I can, I can do it myself I can promote what I want you know it, it so it was it was perfect so eight and a half years ago I started that blog okay and it had his peak at its peak, it, every single episode had more than a million views. Wow. And we have some vlogs that have 4 million views. Now we're in 50,000, 60,000. That thing is gone, that that particular uh, 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 concept. Mm -hmm. Now we're doing something different that we're going to come up and, and, and explore and see what, if people like that it, its name is, in lugar de, instead of el blog, its name is el doc. El doc. As a documentary. So it's more, it's like less frequent, I guess? And it's, it's just one? It's going to be every 10 days now, not every week, but it's going to be more like a never ending documentary. Uh. So the format is more like a documentary. It's not boring. Uh -huh. Okay, it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> I love documentaries. I don't think they're boring. I, think I love documentaries too. Yeah. It, it, they're my, 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 my favorite genre of movie making. Um, so I kind of went there, and we're also starting with, with different property uh, on YouTube. So on the business side of it, it's amazing because if you create content, you're going to keep on collecting. Mm -hmm. So right now we have, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of hours in YouTube. Yeah. So that's a business. Yeah. That's a company. And we, we create more and more and more and more and more content. The difference between people that just uploads pink noise and make money out of it uh -huh. or, or, or whatever it is, that there are a lot of people doing that on, on the platforms. And us is that we provide some quality uh, yeah. product and, and entertainment for you. So it's okay if the, the platform gives us some money for that. Yeah, I think especially now with this newer generation, it, it might even, and I think it does give younger viewers a way to connect with the Aguilar family. Yeah, because they this is the vlog generation. I mean, when, yeah. if you said vlog twenty five years ago, people be like, "What is that? You misspelled blog." But yeah. you're talking about uh, vlog. You just released your new single, Hasta Que Me Duermo. And in one of the videos, you talk about one of the el blog videos. You talk about how with this song, it's a fusion of rock and ranchera. And you were like, "Rock isn't really <laughs> trending right now. Neither is ranchera." But I decided to fuse them because I like them and put them out. So how do you balance that, you know, passion with with ensuring something has some form of commercial success? Oh, that's the sixty-four thousand dollar question. <laughs> if I had that formula, I would be. Coldplay, Jay Z, and <laughs> and not sure at the same time. You know, I I just go with my gut. Okay. And that's that's what I've been trusting since I started my career. You know, what I really like, what I really dig, what I'm really passionate about, what I really feel. That's where I'm gonna go for. So I like corridos tumbados. You know, the music that is amazing right now and putting Mexican music scene in everywhere in the world mm -hmm. and for the first time in the history of music a Mexican song was the number one song in the world in, in many platforms wow yeah but that's not me mm -hmm. so okay it's fine it's trendy it's what's people listening but it's not me mm -hmm. so I'm not going to do that if it's not me I'm, gonna, I'm going to consume it I like it mm -hmm. I like some of it but not to make it for myself. So it was the perfect moment to step a little bit out of the game and say, I'm not going to do what 
some of you people are not the fans, but some of you people in this in the industry are expecting me mm -hmm. to do. I'm gonna do whatever the heck I want to do. So it, it's like part of my persona and personality is not that I'm egocentric or self-centered, or maybe I am a little bit, but I'm, I'm more in love and more passionate about what I do than preoccupied about what others think. So yeah, right now I'm doing something that is completely out of what the industry would tell you to do. Rock and roll, man. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't. I'm proud of the music that I did. It makes me cry. Mm -hmm. It makes me feel to a, to, to a very deep extent, uh, uh, um, to, to a very deep level. Mm -hmm. So that for me is successful. That for me is it, it's success. That to me at this time in my life is the most successful thing and the most successful outcome that I can have. Now, if I can sell an arena tour with this album and this song, I wouldn't be pissed. <laughs> uh, thank you so much if you liked it. If I made you feel with this music, that's twice as success as me being happy. But it's all about that now. It's all about being real. So yeah, it's not trendy. I don't have any duets. It's rock. It's mariachi. It's romantic music. It's me. It, but it's authentic to you, and I yeah. think it, it seems like that's your operating mode. Yeah. Um, modus operandi. That's a fancy word I was looking yes. for. <laughs> uh, so I want to ask you about Jaripeo hasta, hasta los Huesos, but before I ask you about that, I think for some of our viewers who may not know what Jaripeo means, can you briefly explain that? Yes, Jaripeo uh, was the uh, very original form that the haciendas uh, used to domest not domesticate, but to tame uh, uh, bulls and, and, and cattle. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people think that Jaripeo was originated either in Michoacán or in Guerrero, and it was originated maybe 50, 60 years ago. Nope, that is not true. The, the word Jaripeo is originated back in the colonization of Spain and Mexico, okay? So that's, that's where it comes from. And the word Sin Fronteras, by the way, I had to come up with the name because my, my, my associates didn't come up with a name for the show. They, they were supposed to do that. And then they call me and say, we have two hours to come up with a name. You have two hours, only two hours. I say, what the heck is wrong with you guys? This is the biggest gamble in my life for the last 20 years, and I have two hours to baptize it. So I came up with that. You say, you know, something that is very original uh, uh, f uh, from the genesis of this thing. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, Uh, something that also meant that we have no limits, no borders, no boundaries. The sky's the limit. So that's why I said, sin fronteras. And then a president wanted to put walls here and everything. So it was like, sin fronteras, you know? And uh, uh, it, it worked. It worked. The name kind of, kind of, Steer something in, in the fans. It resonated. Yeah. And then tell me about the name uh, Jaripo Hasta Los Huesos. How did that one come about? Oh, okay. That's because Hasta Los Huesos, um, to the bones. Mm, it's because we changed everything from the first and the second show that we did from Jaripeo, which I've done mm -hmm. two editions, different shows, mm -hmm. different things. So this is the third one. And this one is about the Day of the Dead. Everything is about the Day of the Dead uh, in, in Jaripeo. Well, actually, everything is about Mexico right now. Mexico is, it, it is trending all over the world, mm -hmm. all over the world. And, and that is one of the uh, traditions that m most people know, the Day of the Dead, uh, mariachis, tequila. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the Day of the Dead is one very popular one. We're not doing it because it's popular. We're doing it because I like uh, skulls and I like... I like death, not the actual death being that uh, to die, but I like the way Mexicans see death. You know, it's like a folklore thing. Mm -hmm. We dance with it, we laugh with it. So that's what we have in this show. So with the tour, 
a national tour. I've always been curious about the the margins. You know, I'm sure you invest a lot of money into it. Can you tell us a little bit about like how much comes back and how you measure a successful return on investment? Well, I'm, I'm a weird animal because the way I do business is 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 not the way artists normally do business. Okay, Art, artists get get uh, hired and uh, by a company. You could say. Live Nation, probably AEG, maybe CMN, or an independent uh, promoter, and they buy their tours. Mm -hmm. So there are many ways of making money that way. You get a guarantee, and then you get a back end after that guarantee. So okay. that means if you put, let's say, 4,000 people, that will be your break even, uh -huh. uh, uh, 4,000 people. And then after that, you pay your expenses, whatever it is. Uh, publicity if you're the promoter uh -huh. um, uh, taxes uh, stage hands uh, okay. the rent of the plays and everything and then after that the back end you give the artist probably it depends on the deal it could go from 75% to 95% of the back end so that's where you make money uh, more uh -huh. if, if you are hired as uh -huh. an artist I don't get hired I, I do my shows. I promote my shows. Uh -huh. So my margins, uh, it, it, it's a different, it's uh -huh. a different way of, of of doing business. My margins go from twenty five percent to sometimes forty percent. Sometimes it's less than twenty five okay. percent. But it, it it depends on the market. It depends on the venue. It depends on everything. Uh, I have a lot more risk. Than if you were just hired, mm -hmm. because you're hired, you're just hired. But also, uh, a promoter takes around 30% of the business. Uh -huh. That's approximately mm -hmm. what it takes. And if you take that figure out of the equation, that 30% goes to my company. Uh, so that's why I promote your the own. shows. Mm -hmm. But it's not as it's not that easy, and not that uh, uh, as I told you right now. It's it's really a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, the margins are high mm -hmm. uh, for, for, uh, for a business that size. Um, normally, it would be like 20% margin uh, for a business that size if you were selling glasses or something like that. And that would be good, uh -huh. right? Yeah. But in, 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 in show business, it's a little higher than uh -huh. that. But it's a lot more risk. Yeah, and I, I I love this. This was in your one of your vlog episodes. You were talking to a reporter about this upcoming tour, and you said, uh, "Where is it?" You said, "It is gonna have uh, someone from Cirque du Soleil coming to help you with the production design." I imagine. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you bought a hundred fifty meters of screens, <laughs> um, <laughs> and you're using artificial intelligence. Yeah. Uh, that all sounds very expensive. Yeah. So, but but tell me like. Why those, which sound awesome? I'm like, oh, I want to go to that tour. Uh, tell me about why why go so premium with this tour. Well, I'm very proud of my roots. I think that we're just barely. I told you that that I think that Mexico is it's trending all over the world, mm -hmm. and we haven't even seen nothing. Just a little tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. So I'm very proud of my roots. Very proud of my culture. Tremendously proud of them. And I want to present it the best way possible. So it's been a long time. I've done good in my life. I cannot complain. So I'm not going to hesitate. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to be stingy when it comes out of showing what you're most proud of. So that's why we're creating it the best way I know how to, with the best people that I know, and, and presenting it in the best venues in the world. So that's why I'm very proud of my roots. And I think Mexican culture and Mexican music is way bigger than an artist or my career. So I'm focusing on making that the star, you know, the culture, the, the, the music, the festivity of the Day of the Dead, mm -hmm. all that. So that, that's what's keeping me motivated. You know, it's a it's it's a huge undertaking. To, to create the show like that. But now I'm used to making big shows and, and, and 
th those kinds of figures. <laughs> so it's kind of it's it's kind of hard for me to go back. Right. To scale back, that'd be yeah. almost feel unnatural. I, that, to the contrary, I'm creating more shows now that don't necessarily have me in them. Oh. Can you say anything else? Sure. I'm, I'm with this guy, Cirque du Soleil guy, which there's a lot of chemistry with uh -huh. him, a lot of chemistry, and he's so freaking talented. Like, uh -huh. he comes out with so many things that I wouldn't even dream of. Mm -hmm. We're, we're thinking about exploring more of, of, of the Mex this Mexican culture that I think it's huge and amazing. And, and there's one pre-Hispanic show that we're working on already. But it's a pre-Hispanic show done in the 21st century. Okay. So it's like <laughs> old meets new. Yes. Okay. I love Very that. crazy. Cool. Good tease. Good tease. Yes. So I want to talk about that first opening show for Jaripasta Los Huesos. Tell me about what goes into preparing like the day before that first show. And once you're doing that first show, like is this, the show pretty much set or is that the first time you're seeing like what is the how is the public going to react to this concept? Oh, yeah. That, that's the first time we're seeing how the public is going to react. But we have many days of rehearsals before. Mm -hmm. Like we rent the Honda Center this time. We have rented many huge arenas before we start every every gig. Mm -hmm. I'm not every gig, every every tour. Okay. No? So this is no exception. We're gonna be in uh, at Anaheim for three days rehearsing and then everything is time coded. Okay. So I can interrupt it because I like that. I can interrupt and and, and like freestyle a little mm -hmm. bit. If I want to say something, if I want to sing another song, I do that and I make them suffer tremendously. <laughs> all, all, all the technicians, all the engineers, everybody, all the teams, because we have different teams mm -hmm. from in placement. 150 people work mm -hmm. and out of those, 90 of those in production. So, so it, yeah, it's, 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 it's a lot. So we need definitely to rehearse and we are going to do that. And then after that rehearsal, uh, uh, it, 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 if everything goes good, it should always be the same. Like mm -hmm. it, it, everything needs to happen clockwork, like clockwork. But it, it never does. <laughs> 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 I love it. Well, now we know all that goes into. Yeah. The, I didn't know about the time code, it, like the light cues. Everything is everything. Yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I'm like, how do they? It's so many moving parts. Sound design, even yeah. that's a new thing uh -huh. that a lot of people don't know. Sound design is is like special effects. Mm -hmm. There, all of a sudden you hear boom uh -huh. over here, and that's next time you go to a concert, look for that. And everybody's doing it every time, more and more and more. That. The same thing that is happening or something that is happening on the screens that has to do also with the music and it's also synchronized with a special effect and it's also synchronized with a special sound effect. Okay. So you get a whole freaking experience with multimedia. It's like four, four dimension. Yes, sir. Um, all right. I have two questions to end and these are rapid fire questions. Okay. But I'm going to stop calling them rapid fire because it's more like slow fire. They're mm -hmm. a little complicated. Mm -hmm. So take your time answering them. But my first question is, what is your earliest money memory? Like when you first remember the concept of, or learning the concept of money. I'll tell you mine. I learned my numbers one to a hundred when I was in first grade. I was a little late. And my friend asked me, how much do your parents make? And I was like, a hundred, a hundred dollars. I was like, that's right. the most. And they're like, oh yeah, my parents make $200. Uh, I was like, oh, I was like, I don't know any numbers bigger uh, than that. So then I went at home and asked my parents how much they made. And that was my first realization of money. So what was your first realization of, of money as a concept? I used to start, I, I used to work since I was a little boy. My father put me to work in the ranch and, and paid me. Okay. Uh, I didn't know he was doing it just to teach me the value of work and, mm. and, and making your own money. I thought that I was really working. Mm -hmm. He made me believe that I was really important and really working. Mm -hmm. So every Saturday, I went with all the workers of the ranch to to the places where they get paid, and, and I got paid like twenty pesos, mm -hmm. and that a week, and, and that could buy you just so you know, um, maybe. Um, a pair of pants, a pair of blue jeans. Not I, bad. Not bad for a little kid. Yeah. But I didn't. I didn't buy a pair of blue jeans. I, I was waiting because um, 
we didn't drink sodas back then. We drank water out of the out of the rivers or whatever when we were on horses okay. and working. So that day was special day because there was the soda, this Coca Cola. There was two pesos that the guy that pays us, that paid us, uh -huh. used to sell them. Okay. So for me that was amazing. Yeah. You know, that, that thing is two pesos. Oh my God, I only got 20. I gotta save. I'm not gonna drink one. Mm -hmm. But that was when I started learning the value of money because you could get things with it and, and, and things that you liked, right? Nice things. Nice things. For me, it was a Coke. I love it. <laughs> All right, last question. If you had a business school course, what would it be called? And it has to start with Pepe 101 colon. So like something like, mine would be like how to not get scammed outside of an ATM. I'll tell you that story later. Mm -hmm. But what would your, bus your business school course be Okay, called? so it, it would have to be, of course, uh, made for artists, okay. made for people in, in the in the entertainment business, and it would have to say Pepe Hilar curse on no curse is on <laughs> no 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 <laughs> Pepe, that's a different class that's a different class Pepe Hilar will teach you how to believe in yourself more than what other people wants you to believe about yourself. Mm. It was a lot of words, but you know what Let's I Let's do Pepe, Pepe 101, how to believe in yourself more than, ah, no, it's still too long, more yeah. than others believe in you. Okay, well, let's think about it, let's <laughs> think about it. Um, Pepe Hilar. Oh, Pepe, Pepe 101, maximize the belief in yourself. That's and it. There we go. That's there it. Go. <laughs> there you go, because that, 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 Involves everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah. love it. Okay, we're gonna That's we'll trademark that. Let's yeah. trademark it. Let's make a we're business. Good. Let's we'll do it. <laughs> Perfect. I would have paid you fifteen, but that's okay. You only asked for ten. I, I shortchanged myself. That's my business lesson. Don't shortchange yourself. All right, Pippe. Thank you so much for coming by Business School. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Hey, man. If any time, thank you. And and there's a lot more to think that I would love to tell you about what I've done. Maybe you can have me again. Absolutely. One day. We'll do part two of the course. Thank you, Pepe. Man. Thank you. Thanks.